Good morning, those of you who are virtually attending with us at Westside Community Church. Beginning the service, service in Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given him a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we begin our service today, we want to recognize that this is your time. Our hearts belong to you, so we say, and we want to be reminded um, by what we pray now and also by our attitudes and, our, and the Holy Spirit reminding us that you own us, that you are the one that we are devoted to choosing to do that. And we pray, Father, also that as we have this service together, uh, even though we're not here together as the church, our emphasis is on the fact that you are our special guest. You are always the guest of honor. And we pray for our service, Father, the songs, the teaching, uh, all that happens would remind us of how great you are, that we can never know your mind, but it's sure worth studying and understanding better than how our normal, futile, mortal minds comprehend you. In your son's name we pray, amen. Well, we are gonna sing this morning, and so uh, the words will come up on the slides. All you have to do is, if you don't know the song, enjoy it. If you do know it, sing it with us. Just 
Westside, I pray today finds you healthy, yearning to hear the preaching of God's Word. I want to ask you to stand, as I am assuming you have your Bible in your lap, maybe a cup of coffee in one hand, bowl of cereal nearby. But in every way, let's bring honor and glory to the author of Scripture. Beginning in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish son is a grief to his mother. Ill-gotten gains do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord will not allow the righteous to hunger, but he will thrust aside the craving of the wicked. Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. Amen. Let's all pray for our offering and our message today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a beautiful day today. Thank you for taking care of us and blessing us. Help us now give back a little bit of what you have bestowed upon us that is rightfully yours. We thank you so much that you love us that you have given your only son that we should not perish. That in these troubled times of uncertainty, that we know that if we lean upon you, we will be taken care of, we will be content. Let us fixate on you and fi not fixate on worldly things, what we have or have not. Let us remember your promises. Let us remember the greatest gift that you have bestowed upon us, your son. Heavenly Father, I also pray for the uh, message today that each one of us will hear something that we can apply to our daily lives, that it will enrich us, that we can take that and not only use it for our lives, but to help others as well. So I pray for the message today. I pray for all the messages that are going out this Sunday, no matter what church that they are in, if they call you and, and call you their Lord, I pray for their message as well. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for your son, Jesus. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. It is uh, a different kind of day again today as we have people here that's uh, actually producing and uh, causing all of this to happen. I'm so thankful for each person that comes in early and sets things up and turns on the recording and has the microphones and things. Hopefully we will be back in the sanctuary next week. Uh, if you don't know, we've had a lot of work done in the sanctuary, and uh, so because of that, we had to move all the equipment around, and it became unplugged, and so I don't know how to plug it back in together, so maybe Matt will figure it out today, who knows, but uh, we're in the process of doing that. 
Uh, also, uh, I'm finding out that some people are not getting uh, everything. And so um, let me just say to everybody who is watching, if you do not get an invite by Saturday afternoon, you, for some reason, you didn't get the invite. And so uh, just let everybody know that the invites were sent out by noon on Saturday. I don't like to send them out any earlier. We lose them. But also, they'll be attached uh, a paper that you can download. Uh, I've had a lot of people say that they really like the, the new way that we're doing the downloads because I can give a lot more information uh, instead of just one sheet with the fill in the blanks. And so we will be working on that. Um, I hope you have that out and available. We will be looking at that in just a second. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't spend a whole lot of time watching television. And when I do watch television, the one thing that I don't like is getting invested into a television show. And all of a sudden, after watching it for 25 or 35 or 45 minutes, it says to be continued next week. I can't stand that. Let me just say today's sermon is going to be continued next week. And so I just want to let you know right off the bat that I'm not going to be able to cover this particular passage completely today. And so we're going to do the first part today. We'll do the next part next week. So please don't hold that against me, but we are going to be taking a look at different details, but additional information. If you did go ahead and print off your chart, it'll look like this, and it'll say the passage that we're looking at is in Luke chapter 9, it's in Matthew chapter 16, it's in Mark chapter 8. And if you take a look at the chart, you'll find out that one of them starts off by saying in the district of Caesarea Philippi. Now, I know here in America we say Caesarea, but it's Caesarea because they were all named after a Caesar. This one was named after Caesar uh, Herod, and then Herod the Tetrarch had a castle there and a place called Panera. And uh, we'll talk about that. But notice in Matthew, it says the district of. In Mark, it says the villages of. And in Luke, it says while he was praying. It doesn't even tell us where it was. And so if you take a look, these are not conflicts. These are additional informations that if you add them all up, it gives us, fills in a lot of the gaps. So what I did is I went ahead and gave you all the different uh, pages and you can see the differences and then I compiled them. Now this is not adding to or subtracting, but if I was to tell the story, it might go something like this. It says that while they were going through the district in the area of Caesarea Philippi, he was praying alone. And then his disciples came to him, and Jesus asked them, who do the people say? Who do the crowds say? Now, remember in Luke, he has been talking about the crowds and the crowds. So Luke uses that word aklas to make sure that he stays consistent with the aklas about the crowd. Who do the crowds say that the Son of Man is? Who do they say I am? And they said, some say you are John the Baptist, but others say Elijah. And another says Jeremiah or maybe one of the prophets of old is risen back up. But then Jesus looked at them intently and said, but who do you say that I am? And only Simon Peter was willing to answer. And he said, you are the Christos, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the one and only living God. And then Jesus replies to him. Now your version of the Bible says he answered him. It wasn't like Peter was asking a question and he gave him the answer. This word here for answer means he addendumed his answer. He brought it out bigger and better. And then Jesus added to his answer, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Now, I don't know about you, but with Jonah in the Old Testament, I didn't know if that would be a popular name, but it still is a popular name even in this time. Blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, because... No human could make this claim. It is only reveal, revealed by my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Petros, on this Petros, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will try, but it will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then Jesus strictly charged them and commanded them, see to it that you do not tell anyone the things that I have said, that I am the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. And then from that very moment, Jesus began to show and tell his disciples what must happen, that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must suffer many things, that he must be rejected by the elders. And I want you to know it's the chief priests, plural. Because although the chief priest it was only one at a time, once you were a chief priest, as long as you lived, you continued to be called chief priest, much like our presidents. And so if we have a president who is no longer the sitting president, we still call him Mr. President. And so we have the elders, the chief priests, plural, and the scribes, and that group will kill him. He must be killed. 
But after three days, on the third day, he will rise again. He will be raised up. And he said this plainly, no parables, no object lessons, just the facts and nothing but the facts. And then Peter pulled Jesus aside, away from the other disciples, and Peter began to rebuke Jesus, saying, Par be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And then Jesus turned his back on Peter, looked at the disciples, but said to Peter, this is interesting, because he's going to do this after his resurrection. He turns his back towards Peter, looks at the other disciples, but says to Peter, get out of my way, Satan, you're a hindrance to me. Peter, you're not setting your mind on the things of God. You are only thinking about the things of man. But now we've kind of cross-referenced all three of the passages. Let's go ahead and start taking them apart. If you have your Bible open, I'm going to have my Bible open to the Matthew account. And so let's go ahead and turn to the Matthew account, Matthew chapter 16. Um, and I'm going to actually backtrack a little bit. Uh, if we take a look, beginning way back in Matthew 16, verse number 5, it says, When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Now be careful. And he gives them a lesson about bread. He says, be careful about the bread of the Pharisees, the, the leaven of the Pharisees, that a little bit. It, it doesn't take much of worldly influence to completely influence you in an ungodly way. Be careful of that. And he began discussing it among them. And they said, we should have brought bread. It, it goes right off the bat that Jesus is trying to say, be careful of the false teaching. And they're still thinking about just human bread. And so it shows that even though they were with Jesus, they had a, a very low understanding of the complete understanding of what's going on inside. And we're trying to get Matt's attention. Is that right? Okay. And so, uh, and so they, they seem to have a very small understanding of theological things when Jesus is using these object lessons. That's why when we get down, it says, and he began to teach them clearly and plainly, no parables, no object lessons, just nothing but the facts. How many of us do you know that the word literal does not mean word for word? Uh, did you know that if you study the word literally, it means meaning for meaning? And so uh, when somebody says, well, literally a thousand cats was running after my yard. Mark has a thousand cats in his house right now. We would say literally, but what's the meaning? Meaning is he's overrun by cats. And so uh, how do you use the word run literally? because there's so many definitions. You can run after, you time can run out, you can go for a run, things can be running. And so you can't even use the word run literally. And so Jesus said, I'm just gonna be so perfect that you cannot miss what I am about to say. I'm gonna to go to Jerusalem, I'm gonna be rejected by the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, I'm gonna be killed, but don't worry, I will rise again. I will rise again. And so this is what he's been trying to tell them. And they get to this place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, I put a map up here so that you can see it. And if you look way down over here, you can see way down over here, there's a little place called Caesarea by the sea. Now, there are several Caesareas in the Holy Lands. And so you have to be very careful when you talk about which one, so you know which one you're talking about. So this Caesarea, many times people will think, oh, well, he's talking about the Caesarea by the sea. No, let me zoom in a little bit closer. How many of us see Mount Hermon there and this place called Dan? And I'm going to zoom in on that spot right there. That is Caesarea, and it is also the city by the name of Panarea. Uh, it is named after the god Pan. I think I sent you some pictures of what that looked like then and what that looks like now. If you see, there's a two different forks that come down and just north of Hazar, uh, they come together and that's where the Jordan River begins. And so some flow down from the mountains of Lebanon, others from Mount Hermon. If you take a look, that's how close Damascus, the real Damascus, is to Jerusalem. And so you can see that if you go to the Promised Lands and Israel goes all the way up and does a cut, into Lebanon. So there's places where you are actually north of Lebanon and look straight into uh, Damascus from the northern sections of Israel, if you go to Israel today. And so in that area, you can get there and you can see the running waters. Now, these are the, these are the original streams, and these streams are just mad running water all the time. In fact, let me show you just how wild the water is running. <laughs> One on the left is just a still picture. The one on the right is a movie that I shot. 
That is Margaret's head that we just went by. And that water is running year round, ice cold. In fact, just a little ways down, there was a great big uh, wider area uh, where it slowed down a little bit and created some palm, uh, ponds, and there were people everywhere in the water. I mean, it was just refreshing. Uh, just, and that's how fast the river runs there by the uh, northern area where the city is. Uh, this is one of the largest pagan areas in the entire culture of the Holy Lands at their time. Uh, there was temple after temple after temple. I put pictures on there, the way it looked then and the way it looked now on your handout. And it would just be cave after cave after cave with a great big edifice built on the front of it. And uh, I sent you a picture of what the uh, statue of Pan looked like. Uh, the statue of Pan is a, human, a humanoid looking body with a great big head and goat legs. And so if you did download that, uh, you could say, why would anybody be drawn to that? And this is what uh, really is crazy. When we take a look at all of the, the false gods and the carved images, they were grotesque looking. As if all the gods were grotesque. Our God is beautiful and wonderful and loving and gracious and kind. And the false gods are ugly and demonic looking and people run to them. It was almost like a, the more hideous the God looked, the more popular it was. And so the, Jesus asks them in this area with all of these pagan churches all over the place and all of these concepts of Pan. Now I will say that this is not where we get pantheism but in some ways it is, because in every area, in every cave, there was another God. And they would say, look at all the pans. And then we say pantheos, or the many gods, or the gods of pan. And so in this area, Jesus looks at them and he says, compared to all of this, who do people say that I am? And according to all of this, who does people, they say, well, some say that you are John the Baptist. Now, remember, they are still thinking that maybe Jesus is not John the Baptist coming back from the dead, but he has had the mantle of John the Baptist. After they beheaded John the Baptist, Jesus is now picking up where John the Baptist is left off. And that's why they say Elijah, because Elijah gives the mantle over to Elisha as he is taken up into heaven. But remember now, something new, Jeremiah. Now, why would all of a sudden some people start saying he's Jeremiah? Because Jesus was saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so if you take a look at the Jeremiah and the other prophets through 1 Kings and Malachi, you find out that they are preaching repentance. They are saying that there's repentance, and if there's not repentance, there is judgment. And that's what we should still be preaching today, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, but think about the opposite side. If we don't confess our sins, if we don't confess our sins. Now, we're going to talk about the difference between salvation confession and post-salvation confession. Post-salvation confession would be only God can open up our minds to say that Jesus is Lord. Remember, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, verse number 17, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. That means no human can ever just look and say, now they can look at revealed or revelation and say there must be a God, but to say that Jesus is the Son of God is only by election by God himself. No human can say this. No one. And so uh, they would say that Jesus then is saying that you've got to repent, and that's the salvation repentance, but did you know that some Christians still sin? I'm looking around the room and everybody in the room here is looking at me like, please don't call on me right now. But uh, uh, every, everyone still sins uh, because we still have a sin nature. None of us is perfect. The word hamatria in the Greek means we fail to live up to the complete word of God all the time. Um, and so what do we do when we do sin? What does first John tell us that we need to confess that as sin? We need to just admit, Father, I, I, I didn't completely obey. I didn't follow. I did something I shouldn't have done. I didn't do something I should have done. I am living less than obediently to you. I confess my sins. And then what does it say? He forgives us of our sins. How many times have I heard people say, I just don't want to go back to church until I get my life right. Let me just tell us, we will never get our life right. And to stay away from church is to stay away from the very place where we learn how to live better, to act better, respond better to who God is in God's word. And so what they're really saying is, I'm never coming back. 
Because if we wait for man to just all of a sudden say, I think I'll come back to God, that's diametrically opposed to what God says his word is. Now we're going to take a look at two theological concepts in just a minute. But he looks at the disciples and he says, but who do you say that the son of man is? Who do you say that the son of man is? Now, Simon already calls himself in the text, Simon Peter, in verse number 16. But uh, he's writing this many years down the road. And this, Jesus is about to change his name from just Simon, or Simon in Greek, to Simon Petras. Now, it is interesting that the word Simon in Greek literally means the one who hears and obeys. And I don't know about you, but if you think about Simon Peter, that may not be the, the concept you get. But the word Simon means the one who hears and obeys. But if you go back to Hebrew, it also means a piece of a rock. So Jesus changed his name from the rock who hears to the rock who stabilizes. You see, there's a difference between those two. You see, the word Petras literally means a stone of various sizes and various values. Now, again, it doesn't literally mean that because there is an array of, if you were to take a look at some uh, lexicons, there's at least six or seven different definitions of this word. So we can't say that Petros equals rock, but it is included in that glossy of definitions. And so let's put this together. Jesus is looking at him and says, you've always been a rock, but now I want you to be instead of the rock that is potentially not listening and obeying, but a rock that can be used to bring stability. Uh, the rock that Jesus is going to be the cornerstone, but the rock that can be the foundation. Matt was telling me that he's poured cement. This is a perfect illustration for today. He has poured cement, and for 22 Saturdays, it's going to take him to lay brick around the rock and the, and the cement. Sounds like a whole lot of fun. In fact, I would dare say that if anybody would like to have a good day at your house, you could come and teach them how to lay some rock. You would probably be happy to do that. Um, but they would build the cornerstone, and, and then they would lay these other rocks on top and then mingle them back and forth. I should have sent a picture of that as well from when I was in Israel. Um, and so this, the, the foundation is going to be Jesus, but then the two capstones are going to be the apostles and the prophets. And so it says, blessed are you, Peter, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. And I tell you, Peter, on this rock, Jesus being the cornerstone, and then Peter and the other disciples being the, the basin that goes over the top of it. He says, you are the Christ. Now, the word Christos in Greek literally uh, means the anointed one. In the Old Testament, if you take a look at the Greek version of the Old Testament, uh, it will take the word masia, Messiah, and it will translate it into Christos. And so it means the anointed one, the Messiah. But he goes even farther than that. He says, you are the Christos, you are the son, and this word here for son means the only son and means equal to the father. You see, in their world, if you were the son of someone, you were on the same level. And eventually, when that dad ceased to be in charge of the business, you would be the one that would take over. So you were indirectly related. So in order to be the son of God, you had to be deity. And so he's saying, you are the son of God. You are deity. You are God with us. He might even say, you're Emmanuel. Now, let me just say that this is very controversial because most of the places in the Old Testament, when it talks about the one that is going to come, it, it very rarely says that they're going to be deity. By the time Jesus is living, they're expecting the Messiah to come to be a political leader, to be a military leader, to be a human, not a God-man. And so when Jesus and, and the disciples say, I am the Son of God, they say that's blasphemy because they weren't expecting Jesus, the Messiah, to be deity. But they should have. If we go to Daniel chapter 7, let me just read a couple of verses. And then Daniel says this while he is living in the Chaldean area of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He says, I saw in night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, 
and he was presented before him. In other words, the Ancient of Days is God, the Son of Man is presented before God, and then God, in verse number 14, and then God gives him dominion and glory and kingdoms. In other words, God says, when you become the, the human Jesus, I give to you all of this in your earthly person. And so Daniel is saying that there is the Ancient of Days who is always God, and then there is the Son of Man who is always Jesus, and God has given to Jesus dominion and glory and kingdom and powers and peoples and nations and languages that you shall serve him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So even in the Old Testament, they should have been able to look at the Old Testament, specifically the book of Daniel and the writing of Daniels, that they held in very high esteem, and they should have said, who is this son of man? And what was Jesus' favorite name for himself? I am the son of man, dating all the way back. They should have been able to hear what Jesus said, took a look at what Daniel wrote, realized it was inspired by Yahweh himself, and they should have said that we expect our Messiah, our Christos, to be deity. And yet, who are the very ones that reject him? The elders, the religious people, the chief priests, the religious people, and the scribes who had copied over all the books of Daniel. All the writings of Daniel, the very people who knew the scriptures best were the very people that received him the least. You know, that says to me that you can really know the Bible and not know God. I had a person say this one time to me. The people who take the Bible most literally sometimes don't take it seriously. I could win the Jeopardy game of Bible Trivial Pursuit. But you know, that's not going to get me into heaven. In fact, I would dare say that if we ever had a contest and we invited Satan to come, he beat all of us. Wow. Jesus now adds Simon, son of Jonah, and he says, now, Peter, you are blessed. And the first question I have to ask is, why? Why is Jesus saying that you are blessed? Because, and I'm going to put this up, the doctrine of election. Did you know that if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it's not because you all of a sudden had a heart and desire to. I think I have a hankering to get saved today. We are blessed because God loves us. I can't fully understand why God would choose to elect me. I'm just blessed that he did. And so Jesus is looking at all of us who are going to be saved by looking at Peter at this particular time and saying, it's a blessing to be on the good side of God. It is a blessing to be loved by God. You are blessed, not because of who you are, but because of who he is. That is a blessing. Peter, you are blessed. But then it goes a little bit farther. It says this, only God could reveal that. Now, I, I, don't like, uh, I don't talk a lot about the doctrine of illumination, but how many of us know this, that if we're going to study the Bible, how many times do we pray that God will help us understand what we're about to study? Now, God will illuminate us and elect us to get saved, but then we are supposed to study to show ourselves approved under God that a workman can handle accurately God's word. How do we do that? We can't do that just by reading the text. We've got to do that by the illumination of the Father as he illuminates the text. As a, Have you ever read a passage and all of a sudden go, I never saw that before? Doctrine of illumination. And so what does Paul tell Timothy in 2 Timothy? In 2 Timothy, it says, outside of the human body and outside of human desire, it's completely under, un understandable. People can read the text and not get it. But 2 Timothy 1.7 says this. It says, think over what I say. Now, this is Paul talking to Timothy. Think over what I say. In other words, once you hear the sermon, once you get the letter, once you get the text, don't just hear it and say, well, did you hear me? I heard you. Have you ever heard anybody say, did you hear? I heard you. Not meaning is it a cool ability. Did you have the ability to hear? But remember that word acoustics in the Greek literally means the ability to hear and a desire to understand. And so he says, think over what I say. And then the second half of this verse is incredible. It says this, 
for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And if the Lord doesn't give you understanding, you won't get it. So how many times do we pray? And Mark just prayed, pray for the message and pray for the messenger and pray for the receivers of the message that we might get it. Many times when I used to do uh, youth conferences, uh, sometime during the middle, I would say, get it. And if they had been with me before, they would say back, got it. And so they would know that I'm going to be asking them periodically, uh, are you still with me? Are you, am, I, am I making sense? Uh, am I communicating to you? Uh, the job of a herald is to speak the words accurately and understandably so that God can illuminate the hearer. And a God illuminates the hearer through the word of God. So he says, think over what I say, and then the Lord will give you understanding into everything. He goes on to say, and on this rock, I will build my church. Um, and uh, just remember that the church belongs to Jesus. You know, we, we sometimes say our church, but uh, this is not ours. This is his. Uh, we are just stewards thereof. In a few minutes, we're going to go back into the sanctuary and try to figure out why his sound system isn't working. And so we're praying for divine illumination over there, too. Uh, and so uh, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell, even though it may try, it will not prevail against it. I want to read a couple of passages in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19. It starts off by saying this. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. This is talking about after we are saved through the election and illumination process. But you are fellow citizens with the Hagias, with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And so Jesus, as I was saying, is the foundation. Man has poured the concrete. Now he is laying the bricks. And the disciples would go all over the place. And he says, and on this rock, the rock of Jesus Christ, I will then build my church. And you are blessed because you get to be a part of it. Peter, you're going to get to be a part of it. You're going to be laying the bricks for people in Los Baños. I don't know if he said Los Baños back then, but I think he was thinking Los Baños. Maybe he was thinking India, Pastor D. I don't know. And so, uh, because we know we've got two Pastor Davidus with us today. I think he's got Pastor and Pastor, his brother, are both with us from India today. And he says, and Jesus Christ being himself the cornerstone. So we have the cornerstone being Jesus, the apostles and the prophets building up the church in whom the whole structure being fit together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God's Holy Spirit. The church building is not the church, but it is a dwelling place for God. It is a dwelling place for God. But you know what? So is your body. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's supposed to be a dwelling place for God. We should be building and growing and growing and building. And how do we do it? According to Ephesians, it says, on Jesus Christ, and then the words of the prophets and the apostles. You know what that is? The Old Testament and the New Testament. We continue to grow. In Revelation 21, 14, it says this, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Did you know that the church on earth is built on Jesus Christ, the apostles and the prophets, and even into glory, it will still be the foundation of the 12. It will still be the foundation of the 12. In other words, what they started, he said, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because you are building an eternal church that will not only last here until the day of consummation, but it will last, according to Revelation 21, the 12 had 12 foundations, and on them were the name of the 12 Apostles of the Lamb. What an incredible gift. But notice, when Jesus looked at the disciples, he says, but who do you say that I am? And only Simon Peter answered. Now, it could be that they said this, well, we know Peter's going to answer, so we'll just let him answer. Or it could be, have you ever just said, oh, I, oh, I don't know, don't call on me. Um, and so Peter gives the answer as illuminated by God himself. Chuck Swindoll makes this in his spiritual gifts book. 
And if you notice, it's a great picture. Down on the bottom, we have the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then built on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ is the apostles and the prophets. And then it says that he gives some to the church to be evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, what's my job and our elders' job is to equip the saints so that they would go out and do twofold, build up the body of Christ and do the works of service. In other words, who becomes the local missionaries? Is it the pastor? Yes. Is it the pastor alone? No. My job is to equip every single person that calls Westside home, either right now by a video, a, a Zoom, or whether you come in their attendance or whether you watch us on YouTube. My job is to take the foundation of Jesus Christ, to take a look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, the, the, the support structure of the church, and then by way of teaching and studying and studying and teaching and clearly speaking in language that is understandable so that the body of Christ can be built up so that we can do the work of the service. And what is the work of the service? To go into all the world, proclaim the gospel baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And I will be with you. How long? Till the end of the age. That means till the end of the age on earth or till the ages ceases to be. And if you live with God, that means I will be with you forever. There will be no end. There will be no end. And then he looks at Peter and he says this in verse number 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Up well, we're going to have to pick that up next week. And so next week, we're going to actually talk about what does it mean to have the keys to the kingdom? And so what have we learned so far today? We have learned that if you don't know Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Holy One, the Anointed One of the Old Testament, the living deity, the second person of the Trinity who lived and, li and died and was uh, crucified for the payment of our sins, to pay the wrath of God against sin. If you don't know that, it's because God has not revealed himself yet to you. And I am praying, we should be praying that God will, if you have friends or you have family members that have yet to receive Jesus Christ, maybe they know about him, but they've never accepted him. We need to pray, not that they'll read their Bible more, that God will what? Call them, elect them. God will illuminate them. Because this only comes not from flesh and blood. We preach the cross crucified. Jesus saves. And only Jesus saves. If you, don't, if you can't say you are the Christ, if I was to ask you, who is Jesus? And your answer is anything but. He is the Christ, the anointed Messiah, the one and only son of the living God, Jesus of Nazareth. Anything else is the wrong answer. And hear me, everything else is the wrong answer. Maybe we haven't spent a lot of time studying doctrine. I can remember one time I asked people, I said, how would you like it if I just go ahead and do a whole series on doctrine? No, don't do a whole series on doctrine. I don't want a whole series on doctrine. I said, well, how about if I, if I, if I do some teaching and explain what election is and illuminate. Oh yeah, we would like that. I said, you call that the series on doctrine. And so um, just know that sometimes it's not what you say, but how you say it. Election is real. Illumination is real. Uh, before the next time you go to your Bible, I'm going to invite you to take on an exercise. And that is before you start to read God's word, ask God to illuminate your mind. Say, I know what I'm about to read is divinely inspired and it is above and beyond anything I would ever could know on my own. And so please take the words from the page and give me a, better than just the ability to read the words. May the words read my heart. May I think about what was said and may the Lord give me understanding into each of it as it says in 2 Timothy 1.7. And on this rock, on this rock, and I put the rock in capitals. I will say that the rho in Greek is not a capital. It's a lowercase rho. Uh, but on this rock, because I want us to know that this is not Peter I'm talking about right now. And on this rock, the rock is Jesus. His name is Jesus. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the rock on which Peter built. And so if it would have just been a Peter built, sounds like a truck. 
But if it's Peter built upon the rock, it's the engine. I will build my church. Let's pray together. Father, as we think about all that we have started to read and hear today, and as we read this and reread this during the course of this week, Lord, I just pray that it would not be an exercise in, in just the ability to read English or other languages. I would pray that it would be the ability for those languages to communicate from you, through you, and to us who you are, what you're about, how to please you, and how to be able to hear as Peter and Jesus heard, well done, good and faithful servant, blessed are you. And so, Father, as we go through the rest of this day of, uh, as our friends in India cannot even leave their house, and some of us here can leave but cannot congregate, Lord, it would be so easy, as Mark prayed before, for us to get caught up in the things of this world. But, Lord, I pray that as the old line of the hymn goes, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. So give us glory today, Father. Give us grace today, Father, because we are building that grace and that glory on the rock, the rock of the foundation of Jesus Christ. And Lord, if we know anyone that has yet to understand who you are, we would pray that uh, you would do uh, the salvation work in them that you have already done in us. Lord, I can remember a, a young boy who was praying for his brother, and he said, I just can't stand the thought of being in heaven without him. Lord, I pray that we would pray earnestly for those that we know and those that we love and your word tells us we're even supposed to pray for those who decide, 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 despicably use us. Father, the, the prayer of your son, Father, forgive them. They don't know what's going on, what they're doing. Lord, I pray that we would have such a, a love affair for the lost, whether they're in our family or the, the neighbor that antagonizes us, that we would cry out, for election and illumination, and then say, and if you need, use me. Here I am, use me. So Father, use us this week as only you can. Illuminate us this week as only you can. And Father, elect even more, build your church. And even though the gates of hell may try, help us to never forget, it will never prevail. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, in whom we give all the honor, all the glory, for he and he alone is worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in just one second, Aaron's going to come up here and turn all the microphones on, so make sure you say hi to everybody. Good morning, everybody. Have a great day. Whatever. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Terry. That was warm. warning. Good morning, Pastor. Dewey. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Morning. 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 Buenos dias. Morning. Hi. <laughs> Buenos dias. Honey. <laughs> Tell